So everyone has to accept. Yeah. Or Welcome everybody to, I don't know which number this is, but uh, maybe five or six of our first Thursday night free community webinars with Pollyanna, our nonprofit. And Pollyanna is a nonprofit that was created through Studio Petrichor, mm -hmm. landscape architecture design and implementation studio uh, up here in Altadena, California. And Pollyanna's mission is to, <clears throat> excuse me, to um, educate and empower communities to honor yeah. and protect natural living systems, because that's what it all comes down to, living systems from which we exist. Um, I'm going to be adding some information into the chat box uh, in regards to how to contact us, how to donate, how to contact the Wild Yards Project, how to donate, how to follow on Instagram, and of course, upcoming projects. Before we get started, um, everybody would like to ask you to stay muted or, or I'll mute you for you. Um, we are recording. Um, <clears throat> and at the end of the talk and before Q&A, um, we'll put out some more reminders and and that's it. So David Newsom of Wild Yards Project, welcome and take it away. <laughs> Just like that. Just um, like that. All right. So I'm going to share. I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. And uh, we up. Great. How's that look? Does it work? Looking great. Beautiful. Um, I love this Thomas Rainier quote. Oh, by the way. Um, so just as we were getting started, Sean said to me, I'm really looking forward to you talking all about what you do. And um, this talk is more about how I got here. Um, so I will, I will also talk about what I do. It's as much about what I did and how I see it applying uh, in built spaces everywhere, really, and, and the urgency for that. So um, here we go. But I love this quote from Rainer. Uh, Next renaissance of human culture will be the reconstruction of our natural world in our cities. Plants will be at the center of it all. I interjected native plants. Um, I don't know what happened because we did that before I even touched it. Uh, who's that? Um, so uh, flipping the script on our imminent demise, um, <clears throat> I called it that because uh, I think that there's so much language in the media. I think there's so much uh, attention given to the problems facing the planet. And I think it's really... Uh, I don't think we know how anything ends. I think we have no idea. I, I think it's I think it's all happening and it's all being written as we go. And I'm interested in changing the story about how we think about our role in the planet, period. Um, so chapter one, it all started. Uh, I grew just a kid growing up in New Jersey. And uh, I found this picture of me in a raccoon hat, which is great because of course, it's all about the legend of Daniel Boone and the terrifying colonist that he was. And, um, but I did go down a rabbit hole and find out that Daniel Boone was actually uh, a pretty advanced guy. And he was uh, abducted by the Shawnee. A chief's son had been uh, killed. And in reciprocity, he took uh, a colonist's son and he took Daniel Boone. And Daniel Boone learned from the Shawnee. He adopted their ways. He learned their language. He studied their spirituality. And eventually he got loose and he got back with his family. But he fought really hard to, um, to live with the Shawnee. And he pushed for the state of Kentucky to actually create laws so that the different the colonists and the Shawnee and all the different indigenous cultures could live together with inequity and have robust cultures. And as we all know that worked out really well. Uh, anyway, his heart was in the right place. And for me, growing up in New Jersey, I grew up in the Jersey suburbs, uh, tract houses all after World War II. But on the other side of those tract houses were fences and tertiary and secondary forests, old, uh, old farms breaking down. And once I jumped over those fences out of that development, I landed in a world of uh, Redback salamanders, pickerel frogs, and my favorite, which were these box turtles. And so my baseline experience in nature was great. I had an amazing baseline experience in nature and it informed how I thought about life and what I wanted from the world. And it actually was sort of my engine for sanity. Um, 
so I never forgot it. And over the next several decades, I, uh, I kind of put all that stuff behind me for a little while. I went into film and television and uh, I had a 20 year career in film and television. This is me being killed by Freddy Krueger, uh, which is one of my favorite moments in my life. And, and then a pivotal change in my life when I met my wife and produced her first film that went to Cannes and it won the Cannes Cine Foundation. And I uh, was heading off in a whole new direction in my life at that point away from being on camera and being behind the camera and getting more immersed in telling stories and working in film and television as a storyteller. And during that time, I was also a photographer. And I spent a lot of time traveling around the West and just kind of taking pictures and sitting in stillness in natural spaces. I would often meditate. I ended up working with a shaman for a long time who, uh, we worked with ayahuasca and a bunch of other plants and who helped me sort of refine the thing that mattered to me most in my life. After 20 years in film and television, I was pretty burned out. And the thing that I knew, the thing that I discovered very powerfully at that point is I wanted to be in the natural world and I wanted to be in service to it. I had no idea how to do that. Um, but what I did know is that I wanted to be in it. So I spent a lot of time in it uh, photographing it. We moved my brother, who is mentally disabled, from New Jersey out to Idaho. I began doing portraiture and photography with him. I ended up publishing a book about him in the land called Skip. And that was sort of the beginning of a whole new transition in my life where my relationship to the land was guiding me. And uh, I was also producing with my wife and producing nature documentaries and things like that. And then, you know, this happened. So now we're in Los Angeles, we're pregnant, we're looking for a home. And we got these two kids a few years later. And at that point, this, this urgency to have a relationship with nature and to be doing something in service to nature became very profound. And I, uh, I was worried, uh, as I was telling Sean earlier, I got really worried about what their relationship would be to the natural world. Like what would, what would their baseline experience of the natural world be? Because if you don't have that baseline experience, my great concern is that it's hard for you to have any regard for it. And as we all know, and as we'll sort of talk about, those things are all under threat and those threats are very real. So we found a house. We had found a house, a love, I love when flippers give you lawn, but they don't irrigate it. I like that. That's a nice look. Um, we found a house uh, right on the edge of a very busy city. And my biggest anxiety was how will my kids find wild in a place like this? Where would they find it? How will they have regard for it? What will they want to nurture it or take care of it if everything is cars and concrete? And so on a trip back east, uh, when my daughter was about two, uh, we were wandering around New England and I took a bunch of pictures of her. And I just knew above all else that I wanted her to have that. My obsession became, how could I surround my children with the natural world where I lived. I didn't know anything about gardening. I'm not a botanist. I wasn't educated in gardening. I, I didn't study landscape design. I just knew that I loved the natural world and that I felt I needed to be in service to it. And that sent me down the journey of the lawn, the 40 million acres uh, of lawn in the US, 10 billion gallons of fresh water daily, 80 million pounds of pesticides a year, 90 million pounds of chemicals, 5% of our carbon emissions. And a UC Davis statistic that I loved from a study was that the average American child uses their lawn an aggregate of 40 minutes a week and adults 10 minutes. And then another statistic is that of that, they use 20%. So uh, that struck me as outrageous and terrifying. 
The other thing that I learned is that the planted landscape of most cities, and this one is Los Angeles, in this case, uh, the new phytologist study, that only 4% of the cultivated landscape of Los Angeles involves indigenous plants. The other 96% is exotic. And then all the stats around habitat and species loss, 30% of all bird species loss since 1970, approximately 40% of all insect species in serious decline. These are from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology and the Biological Conservation Journal. All of these facts kind of bearing down on, you know, my understanding of the world as we live in it now and resulting in, for not just me, but a lot of people, environmental depression. Uh, it's uh, very high among teenagers. I think, uh, I think they're now saying that about 50% of all teenagers are experiencing environmental depression, uh, a fear of a world in decline, powerlessness, lack of agency. And um, that too began to just weigh on me really heavily. Um, this notion that we are powerless is a terrifying notion. And enter reconciliation ecology. I stumbled onto the writings of Dr. Michael Rosenzweig, who just said, a reconciliation ecology is the science of inventing, establishing, and maintaining new habitats to conserve species diversity in places where people work, live, and play. And this for me was like, wow, did you see the way my light just went on when I did that? Um, I didn't, I don't know. I didn't plan that. That for me was a powerful revelation. It, it imbued me with such a powerful sense of urgency and agency because prior to that, my thinking about how to protect the natural world was somewhat removed from me. It was like, oh, I'll give money to the Sierra Club or I'll go high. Like I didn't have an active hands-on involvement. I didn't have a concept of how to do that. And so with this kind of cumulative building set of concerns about baseline experience for my kids and depression and dis, uh, you know, the lack of agency that I'm experiencing both in myself and in the people around me, uh, this idea was the thing that lit a huge fire. And of course, reconciliation starts with indigenous plants. Why? Because of coevolution, plants and animals evolve together. The quick, um, you know, the quick Ptolemy re recap, uh, these numbers meant a lot to me. 90% of all leaf-eating insects apply on native plants for food. And the further you get from that native local species as you move into cultivars, the less they are chosen by those animals. Um, an average nesting pair of birds consuming between 6,000 and 9,000 caterpillars per clutch. Uh, those numbers kind of put me on my ass. Um, so boom, so here we are, we're back at our house. And now I have kind of a, <clears throat> you know, I have an urgency, but I don't know anything. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't really know anything about native plants. I'm, uh, I'm just going and going over to Theodore Payne and a couple other places there and sticking them in the ground and trying to figure out what'll work. And this is what's there now, which is really kind of a history of, <laughs> It's kind of, it is, these are not hyper-local species at all. Some are, but they start all the way in the back in the, in the shade section as mostly uh, kind of Sierra, the Mahonia berberus, Mahonia aquifolium. And then we move across into some of our more sun-loving species, some local, some not quite so local. But this was my laboratory. This is where I started working with native plants. And what did happen immediately that blew me away and, and began to give me kind of a, uh, a structure for how I think about how we move forward and where to apply it was when I had toeys, toeys, wrens, hummingbirds, bush tits, warblers, digger bees, leaf cutter bees, alligator lizards, western fence lizards, bush katydids, shorthorn grasshoppers, shorthorned, uh, I mean, skipper butterflies, painted ladies, hair streaks. It was the, the amount of life that was there that hadn't been changed my life in short. It just changed my life. And that's when I started to create the Wild Yards Project, mostly because I was taking pictures of it, posting it under my name on Facebook, on Instagram, and friends of mine were going like, what the hell are you doing? So it was very naive. It was very just me sharing whatever I was discovering and, and seeing. And that's how this whole thing sort of began. The backyard, this was kind of like the prison chic vibe when we bought our house. 
this is our backyard now. I, I'm, I, I feel like I'm being very, very brave here and very honest by showing my Carrick's hair plugs. They're brand new, but you know, this is it now. And this is, it sticks a little bit more to a more straight species from the region. Um, and again, an enormous amount of wildlife has shown up. And it's important to know that I live 50 feet from a major, you know, urban intersection. Uh, so now we have finches, red-shouldered hawks, cooper's hawks, towhees, bush tits, warblers. Again, the digger bees, leafcutter bees, bumblebees, fence lizards, shorthorn grasshopper, morning cloak, butterflies, hair streaks. I'll get into all that. Suffice to say, the land is alive. And this was the first photograph I took of a native bee on a, the Cleveland sage. Um, and this was what led me sort of down the path of trying to understand how our native plants function versus, you know, plants that I had from Home Depot when I first started doing this. Um, this is a longhorn melicity summer bee, and it loves and lives and uh, the males will sleep on this plant. Um, I didn't know anything. I didn't even understand the difference. I thought they were like bumblebees and honeybees. And so when I took a picture of this thing and it, you know, didn't look like a honeybee when I got it under the loop. Um, this was an animal that got me on my journey. And sorry, I'm gonna move this because it's blocking my text. But sort of just pausing for a second, the next, so here's a green sweat bee on the Ariaganum rubescens blossom. Um, this led me down an obsessive photographic kind of wormhole where I just wanted to photograph every bee in my yard and try and figure out what it was. I'm not very good at it because I find them very hard to ID. And uh, thank God Crystal Hyman's out there. But here, uh, what I didn't know is that there were over 4,000 native bees in the US and uh, that don't live in colonies. And we have about 160 indigenous to Los Angeles alone. Um, and those have very specialized relationships to the native plants. Um, and that just became, again, another sort of call to arms for me. Um, one of the things that I became very obsessed with too is that I saw a lot of native horticulture where they were just being basically like traded in other words, they were being used in a decorative sense that didn't really, uh, to my observation, actually create habitat. So I started trying to figure out what makes habitat. And so it's obviously native plants, food. Do the plants provide food? Do they provide shelter? And do we have water? And looking at food occurring from nectars and pollens, seeds and fruit, and insects and the protein, you got, you know, we have the... Uh, uh, Buckeye, this is actually a shot on uh, our land in Massachusetts, Buckeye coming down to the cone flower, and the lesser goldfinch working the seed heads of the Cleveland sage. The cool thing about the lesser goldfinches, and I'm sure those of you who have gardens notice it, they'll bring their young and they'll teach them how to, uh, how to gather from the seed heads. And also, obviously, the bush tits, which come through in that tinkling cloud and kind of like just clean off all your all the pests off your plants, particularly useful in spring when you have all that fresh, vulnerable growth going. And shelter and letting things grow over and letting things get sloppy and not being too controlled about your space and providing shelter for the Bevix wren that comes in and is a very shy bird as it picks the insects off the new growth and the alligator lizards moving through the, you know, in the, the, the low ground cover plants. And this is a Cooper's hawk actually eating a rat up in our jacaranda, nailed it down on the sidewalk. Cooper's hawks are actually aerial feeders. Uh, they have that extended claw, unlike a red-tailed hawk or the ground feeders, but he got a rat, swung up into the tree and was chowing it up there. Just felt safer doing it, obviously. And of course, water, which I think is often overlooked in native gardens. So I just started putting this list together in my head of how I can approach it, how we can make it repeatable. I, and, uh, and sharing that with anybody, my neighbors, my friends, you know, colleagues and stuff like that uh, as much as possible. And then the big three sort of super objectives of a native garden that when you use those previous principles of native plants and uh, 
food and water, you let your leaf litter lie, then you're infiltrating water, you're amplifying biodiversity, and you're sequestering carbon with that humus, that leaf litter. Um, and then it starts to play a, a much bigger role. You're just kind of stacking the value of your garden as you go. And, uh, and all these things, super exciting to me. So um, I'm gonna stop down the, when I used to travel, there's driving around the West and taking pictures and kind of sitting out in the natural world and taking, I didn't think that that was an experience that I could, that I could replicate at home. Um, but now for me, when I'm in my backyard or in my front yard or down at the school garden that I have, um, it's as powerful, as resonant and as meaningful and maybe a little bit more than some of the best hikes and stuff that I've done and I've done quite a bit. Coming out the first morning that I saw these, these are male Melissides bees, longhorn summer bees on the Cleveland sage, holding on in that in the cool morning and they've slept there all night because they're not going down in the tunnels with the females. They're sort of kicked out. Um, seeing that for the first time was one of the most, like, <laughs> I, I thought they were dead. I thought that I had done something terrible. I had killed them and I had to kill, call a friend of mine who is a, um, entomologist and ask him what was happening and he explained it to me and again watching the bush pits come through and work they always start as I've said before they start on the northeast corner of our property they come into the toyon and they work through the toyon and they and they slowly work themselves very predictably through to the southwest corner of our property this young red-shouldered hawk did one of the most amazing things I've ever seen in my life. So I didn't know, I'll, I'll, I'll just say this. Came down on this branch, about 18 inches off the ground, and was staring at the ground, and then jumped down into the leaf litter and started kicking through the leaf litter, and then started eating worms. And I, it just struck me as insane. I had no, I couldn't figure out why it was doing that. So I called Scott Logan over at Wild Wings Ecology. And I said, why is this red-shouldered hawk eating worms out of my garden? And he told me that 80% of all hawks die in the first year of their life, as all do, all raptors do. That actually hunting is extremely hard and very few succeed at it. And so what this red-shouldered hawk was doing was finding protein the only way that it could. And when we do that thing of leaving our leaf litter and creating that vital humus, it's also a powerful food source for a huge range of animals. And I didn't even know that, I had no idea, but it was a very cool thing to experience. And again, it, it was an aha moment for me in understanding the value that even a small garden can have in an urban area. Um, I think we forget that sometimes. I think we get caught up in all kinds of like big plans and big ideas and stuff like that. But when we are still, when we are still to the space, when we're just in it, in the same way that I would go sit out, you know, in Idaho, in the Teton Valley or whatever, you know, out in, out in um, Mammoth and things like that. When we be still ourselves to the spaces we're creating here in these urban areas, they are just as vibrant, just as alive, and I would say, you know, arguably more important. So again, these are male sweat bees coming into the poppies at the end of the season. They, at some, for some reason, late in the season, they come in on mass. Uh, I've spoken to Crystal about it. Uh, I, I can't remember exactly what she said, but it's just a phenomenon that they do. The alligator lizard working through the mulch. This is a painted lady butterfly coming onto the Cleveland sage. I don't know if you remember a couple of years ago, uh, Northern Mexico had a drought. <clears throat> and so clouds of painted ladies were coming up through Southern California looking for few food. And uh, they, I had tons of them in the garden, hanging out on the sages, working the nectar. And, uh, you know, again, animals don't have borders. So trying to find a way to just provide these islands for biodiversity and of biodiversity anywhere and everywhere um, it's impossible to predict when they will become essential, but they're, you know, always valuable. This is Coop. 
he was a young uh, Cooper's hawk who learned to hunt in our yard. And uh, for, the, for the first year, let me get very close to him a lot. And he'd come in and feed. Sometimes he'd catch finches off the feeders or whoever was, you know, not looking out for themselves. Birds are very paranoid, but uh, he had a pretty good success rate in our yard. He'd get about two kills, two to three kills a month. He'd eat them on top of the feeder or on top of the house and then hang out and let me photograph them. Again, I think just a really cool thing, you know, 50 yards from Colorado Boulevard. So going back to that concern about a baseline experience, you know, I, uh, this is just a quick little video I shot a little while ago. I hope you can hear the audio. It's, you'll hear me yelling. I'm not yelling at my kids. I'm yelling at my dog, but it's real simple. And I know we've all experienced it, but this for me made me feel it just confirms what's important to me about, oh, it says you can't play media. Oh, there we go. Oh, no sound. Try it again. Sound good there. Slow, slow, slow. <laughs> so those little experiences add up to me and my daughter and my son's constant interaction with the bees and with the lizards and with the birds that land and the butterflies that come through it's not that I expect them to have the same kind of OCD that I have about the natural world. It's just that that's, that's getting in their DNA and it's getting, it's forging neural pathways. It's giving them a love and a respect and an awareness of the wild world that they otherwise wouldn't get living 50 feet from Colorado Boulevard. And that was so important to me. And uh, been worth everything, really all I can say. So the, as you, many of you probably know, the Biodiversity Project at the Natural History Museum, Los Angeles, it's the biggest urban wildlife study that's ever been done. 80 sites, 1,872 samples, 500 species identified, uh, new species discovered. The new species that they discovered were forid flies. And a lot of those were in Northeast Los Angeles. Um, these little tiny flies that you see kind of just hovering not, um, sort of in, in little tiny clouds in your garden. And what I thought was uh, really cool about that is where do forward flies breed? I didn't know. That's right, Mando, in your leaf litter. So these practices, again, when we think about practices, when you're stacking the value of things, the leaf litter, which obviously sequesters carbon and provides all these proteins and other things for for wildlife, while all these, this, you've got a variety of sort of micro uh, ecosystems happening in there, and you are feeding a lot of life. Uh, most people don't know that only about 6% of a hummingbird's diet consists of nectar. The other 94% is flies, mostly forward flies. Um, this is a scene I photographed in Massachusetts. This is a mama barn swallow. And uh, um, the mother and the father feed their chicks. And there was five chicks on this day at this feeding. And I followed a study and they found out that swallows can feed their chicks up to 720 flies each per day. So when we live in an area where there isn't an enormous amount of the intact natural world creating these vibrant, um, natural ecosystems where we live becomes even more vital. 720 flies each per day, that number still uh, knocks me out. Um, so native habitat gardens represent the whole community. When I think about the whole community, I'm really thinking about Robin Wall Kimmerer's, you know, idea that it's plants, they come first, they were here first, animals next, and we're at the bottom. Um, and we have a lot to learn from all of those things. And that's how I think about our yard uh, when, when I talk with the kids, <clears throat> a lot of times people have friends, you know, they, they bring their kids over 
and they stomp through everything. And I'm, and I'm like, what? <laughs> what do I, do? I don't want to be not fun, but get the hell out of the garden. And uh, my kids are really good. They just walk around, they, they play like crazy, but they're respectful. They, they treat those things like living things and reversing that pyramid and putting the people on the bottom in that system is a really powerful tool for my kids. And it helps them when we go out hiking or when they move through the world. I, I like that they treat the natural world with respect. Not like, you know, it's no fun, but almost like it's an elder that they like. So uh, in short, uh, designing for habitat is design that puts a region's plants and animals first in order to create a more vibrant and livable world for all of us. Um, and how we push back on the doomsday effect, this, this, you know, Generation Z, and I think a great deal of the population is suffering from environmental um, depression. Uh, I like this quote uh, from uh, Kate Marvel, who was one of the people interviewed, interviewed in this uh, Washington, um, I'm sorry, uh, I forget what newspaper it is, forgive me, I'll pull it back in a minute. But I liked her quote. And she said, the message we're all gonna die, how dare you say there might be some, nothing we can do. It's not supported by science. A climate scientist uh, and mathematician, Kate Marvel at Columbia University. I'm not saying that we can all rest and I'm not saying that we live in the best of all possible worlds, but one can have a sense of optimism by working towards a solution. And I don't think anything that I've ever done gives me greater joy and a more real sense of agency than creating habitat gardens and helping them, helping schools and individuals create those gardens. So this is the first uh, school-based garden that I did. This is at Westminster Child Center down. It's uh, connected with the Eagle Rock Presbyterian Church. It's about 3,500 square feet. And I, again, uh, I really had, I didn't know much at the time. I just talked to the pastor. He was talking to me about my garden. He said, let's do it here. I probably didn't prep the land correctly. I made a lot of mistakes, but we got uh, about 200 native plants, uh, both donated and that we purchased. Uh, Nick Hummingbird came down and helped us on that day. And all the kids came out, a lot of parents came out. We got them in the ground and that was my first community garden that I did. Um, it's now three, oh, I guess four years in the ground and doing really well, although the, the rain uh, brought with it a, a great amount of good and a great amount of weed pressure. I didn't know anything about sheet mulching back then. I don't want to talk about it right now. Um, other ideas that I, in, in terms of exploding this model and, and things that move it around, this is a live structures that are out of Brooklyn. They're doing rooftop gardens with native plants. And... Uh, I like their ethic. I like the way they work. And of course, rooftop gardens are heavy and they're not always feasible, but I think getting them in everywhere and bringing biodiversity and the ability to work with um, plant ecosystems in the inner city is, is a beautiful way to expand this model and keep cracking open people's heads about what is possible and where it's possible. Um, Janet Valenzuela, she's a community organizer. This is um, Eastside Yards for Social Justice. They combine native plants with decentralized gardens. And I love this quote from her. The use of native plants in low income neighborhoods is a practical way to connect people to the outdoors and to, and to the plants that once thrived in abundance here. Having native gardens, green space and sacred spaces that liberate us from harm, environmental threats have a significant way of empowering community residents in a built environment. Uh, I love the work that they're doing all down through the 710 corridor. And I love this idea of combining native plants also as food, but also to, to give people agency while they're building their farms and things like that, to amplify their biodiversity, to bring in more pollinators, but also to, to, to connect them to the land more meaningfully. Um, Anina Gerchik, bird link. I just thought this was a cool crack open your head thing. She's doing these bird link uh, native gardens uh, all around Brooklyn. They're modular. Uh, she does a survey of the native plants in that region, and then she has these box that are fed. She has a, a watering system for them. This, is, this one's in the field because it was a test, but she has them within the city, and they get a lot of pollinators, a lot of native birds, and they also teach people about, uh, obviously, the indigenous um, flora while they're doing it. 
Um, Mary Young Bear, this is in, uh, she's in the Mescaui Nation in, in Iowa, and she has converted. They've now converted, I, I think the number is, I, I don't have it on here, I should, but they've now, they started out with just a few acres, and now I think they're up to 800 acres of native restoration, and she uses that to teach um, the, you know, the young kids in their nation, in the Mescaui, Mescaui, Mes Waki Nation, all about their history and their relationship to plants and their dependence upon them. It's a really successful program. So <clears throat> I referred to it before, I'll just say it, uh, because this to me is a really beautiful uh, guidepost in terms of thinking about these things. And it's from Robin Wool Kimmer at the end there in Braiding Sweetgrass. In the Western tradition, there's a recognized hierarchy of beings with, of course, the human being on top, the pinnacle of evolution, the darling of creation, plants at the bottom. But in native ways of knowing, human people are often referred to as the younger brothers of creation. And we say that humans have the least experience with how to live and thus the most to learn. And we must look to our teachers among the other species for guidance. Their wisdom is apparent in the way that they live. They teach us by example. They've been on the earth far longer than we have been and have had time to figure things out. Um, and so I created the Wild Yards Project uh, in 2018, and I've been sort of learning as I go. I started out uh, just doing sort of writing about it and interviewing people. Uh, once COVID came and I really inherited my kids, uh, I did less of that, and I just started putting plants in the ground. I, so I've been working really hard on that. I've been doing, a, I do a lot of consultation. I'm doing private gardens and my big focus is on school gardens. Uh, I just wanna do as many as I can. I think the LAUSD desperately needs to obviously get their campuses depaved, but also to create nature-based gardens with curriculum because going back to what I said before, I really feel like nothing will give you greater agency. Uh, you know, a friend of mine once said, it's not the schoolyard bully taught, you know, it's not the fight with the schoolyard bully that's hard. It's those three periods before when he's just taunting you, saying, I'm going to beat the crap out of you after school. When you're in the fight, you're in the fight. I think that so many kids and so many people live with an abstract relationship to climate change and, and habitat loss and species loss. And it's all very anxiety producing. But I really feel like if you give people the skills to at least interact with it, it's so empowering. So that's that's really where my head is at, doing whatever I can to give people the knowledge and to get them started with that agency, to discover that agency. Um, that's it. That's what I got. Hello. Thank you so much. Wow. Um, wow. Thank you, David. This is yeah. amazing. Um, uh, we can keep this screen up for a minute. I did want to let everybody know, everybody who came in late, this is being recorded and it will go up on our YouTube channel within the week. And, oh, there's another slide. That's just the end. Oh. 40 million acres of lawn, 10,000 species a year lost, got dirt, get wild. Don't forget it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, before we get into questions and answers, uh, I'm going to put in one more reminder Another reminder in the um, chat box. Chat box. My brain. Words. It's late. It's almost bedtime mm -hmm. for me. Um, I do want to let you know that uh, uh, Pollyanna exists um, to educate and empower communities uh, to honor and protect natural living systems. <laughs> Just like the Wild Yards Project, we are so aligned, and there's many opportunities to get involved. Pollyanna is, of course, always looking for collaborators and board members who want to help uh, create more events like this and some of our hands-on workshops that are coming. Um, there's an opportunity in the chat box to donate, and uh, as well as to donate to the Wild Yards Project and follow both of us on Instagram. The reason I have the uh, Studio Petrichor Instagram is most of the uh, events are posted there tagging Pollyanna as we are building our board and our team. Um, Help with social media is always a tricky one. Um, I did want to let you know that we do have some awesome upcoming events, which you can uh, see on the Studio Petrichor website next 
month, the uh, for the first Thursday night free community event is actually going to be Lee and myself. We're going to be reviewing designing whole systems gardens, which is basically uh, a reduced version, the highlights of our uh, four part design course that we teach at the Theodore Payne Foundation, which is soon to become a six to eight module course. And um, and don't miss this one. Don't miss this one. It's already halfway full. Phenomenal site analysis with Make Conscious and Studio Petrichor. That is going to be phenomenal. Um, I'm going to leave it at that. I'd like to open up the room for questions. David, I'll have you unshare your screen so we can see everybody. And I'll ask everybody to raise your hand so we can call on you in order. <laughs> Anybody going to raise your hand? Nobody. No? I, I want to know which Freddy Krueger movie. Elizabeth. <laughs> Elizabeth would like to ask a question. Elizabeth. Hi. Hey, David. Thank hey. you. Hey, nice <laughs> to see you. Good to see you. Are you, are you hey. painting? I am. I am. I have a crazy deadline, so I've been painting the whole time, but listening. Um, so I know we've talked about school gardens before, but I wonder if you can talk a little bit about some of the the um, hurdles that you have to get over in school communities in order to make that type of curriculum and those types of gardens happen. Um, yeah, I'm still yeah. so love it. <laughs> well, I mean, first of all, there's, I mean, between, you know, um, Kathy, Sean, and, and Parker, there's a lot of school garden history there. I know that in the LAUSD, sorry, my voice, my voice just made it to the end of that. Um, the LAUSD is hard. Um, if there's anyone on here who works with the LAUSD, I don't mean, I'm not, a, I don't mean to, to offend anyone, but um, it's just, it's a big um, bureaucracy to get through. And um, and so what we're trying to do with the Toll and Way School, I, I'm just starting this. I'm actually Saturday is my first day of officially going in. We're going to first start building a bunch of small hoogles, and then we'll then we're going to pace it out, uh, try and do the whole garden over three or four days, volunteer days. Um, you know, you can't. The, the biggest problem is a uh, getting everyone on board to really understand the value of it. Uh, that's the communication, which is what I learned sort of, I had to back into it sort of painfully with the Westminster with the Eagle Rock Presbyterian School Garden. Um, because even though I thought I had understanding, even though I thought I had agreement, uh, it didn't go deep enough. And so we went through a whole thing three years in, as you know, where they were gonna just rip it all out and they just wanted a lawn again. Um, so I had to do that process and, and sort of start the whole process over again to, to sort of make a, a, a bid for the garden and why it was there. Um, but I think, you know, it, it, it depends on the size of the bureaucracy. I, I, I've talked to a lot of people who said the Pasadena schools, they're easy. I mean, that they're, mm -hmm. they're actually really into it and they make it fairly easy. LAUSD, it's very, very hard. It's years before you get to actually start to break ground. Um, and, uh, and so then the approach to it is trying kind of work, I mean, not illegally, but as, as kind of like to do as much of it as you can by yourself and, um, and also start small because there's all this, there's a lot of goodwill. There's a lot of money that they want to put into this whole depaved LAUSD and green the schools. And I know that the infrastructure bill, uh, there's a lot of money that's going to go toward that, but trying to get everybody under the same umbrella and get everybody to understand like what the agreement is and what matters, um, is tricky. So I can't even speak to it with authority because to me, the curriculum part, the agreement that every time you enter that garden, you know, that that the garden is important, it, the, that the plants are more important, that animals are more important, and you're a, you're a steward and you're a guest. And even trying to get that language solid takes work. It takes work you gotta, with, with each teacher. And the big thing I, I find with schools is it has to be an inside job. There has to be somebody in there that wants it more than I do. Uh, that's the most important thing. I have to want it desperately. And, uh, and then if you can build that agreement and make sure that your communication flows all the way out to those who might be able to impact it negatively and everyone signed off on it, that's, you know, that's where I'm at right now at the Tolan Way School. 
Um, it's not as hard at other schools. I, I'm working on another garden in Atwater and, and it's taken them a very, very long time to actually get the money and things like that. So it's slow. My experience is actually very young, I think, compared to a lot of people. And uh, I, my observation is just working with the LAUSD, which I feel is hyper important, uh, is slow going. Um, Jenny, uh, you have a complex question. I'd love for you to show yourself and ask out loud if you might, if you wouldn't mind. And if not, I can do it for you. <laughs> no. Oh, is this about the lawn? About the yes. Lawn well, there's a lot of different camps on this one, Jenny. Are you still? Yeah. Here? Uh, you know, everyone's got an opinion about it. Some people don't like to remove it. Some people like to just kill the grass, but with sheet mulching, some people do it with fire. Um, I think uh, I think Sean and Kathy and Parker could take a really solid whack at that one. Um, well, I mean, uh, okay. Um, the the question about disturbing the microbial life in the soil. I mean, there's ways to optimize that for sure. Uh, our, our our approach is, uh, you know, cut it turn it, kill it, maybe put it in a hugel culture berm, but lasagna mulch or sheet mulch with cardboard heavily, depending on the type of grass and how pernicious it is. And then, um, you know, we've had, uh, you know, 98% success and the rest is manual after that. I'd also say that you're not uh, destroying the microbial life. The only reason microbial life would be destroyed is if it were anaerobic. Uh, and we're doing the exact opposite. We're introducing more carbon, building soil structure, and uh, incre increasing the health of the soil by the processes we use. Yeah, that's been my observation too. That the only time when I when I think there's microbial damage is when you you know when they um, solarize it. Mm -hmm. Solarize it cooks it. It it does return, but removing the grass isn't the same as solarization. No. <clears throat> I know Tahere, you know, Shirazi, she, uh, she just, she just covers it all in about five inches of mulch with this, and she leaves the grass, which is another way to do it. Um, there's, and again, like Nick Hummingbird, he only believes in torching it, just killing the grass, which takes a long time, it's a slow process. Uh, I, we tried it at the church. We didn't have success with it, but, um, yeah, I mean, i I did, um, I only did a few, but I did four sheet mulchings last year and they, they all took really well. Yeah, I find it very, very helpful, the sheet <clears throat> mulching. Um, I don't like uh, getting rid of all the life that I've put into a space over the previous years mm. or that someone else has done all the energy and thought and water and the nutrients that are there but by uh, sheet mulching or lasagna mulching, those go back into the soil to source it. And I like that. Yeah, we're fans of the cardboard version, not the paper version. Yeah. Uh, okay. Kathy Kramer's a gigantic sheet mulching fan. Yay. She got a video. <laughs> Parker, Parker from the Witness Protection Act. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I uh, I've tried. I haven't really tried solarizing yet. Um, I've only sheet mulched areas, and I don't know. Yeah, Nick's anti mulch thing is like I think it's interesting, but I have I have had really bad luck with that putting down some kind of barrier. I actually use paper most of the time. Well, I think cardboard is better because it's got that glue in there that's good for the fungus, I know. Um, but uh, but usually it's just um, easier to roll out a ton of paper real quick. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I'll try any, I'll try anything once to kill a lawn, though. You know what I mean? Like I, I'm definitely planning on solarizing this summer some areas. I think that the work that we do afterwards in terms of the soil like would bring it back pretty cool. i've already seen that like uh we did a workshop with 
uh, this lady, Teresa, and um, the Matt Washington, uh, along with Grey Water Core. And she had solarized before we met. And so that's kind of what I went into it with. And she was planning on sheet mulching afterwards. And we dug swales and built hugels. And the soil seems pretty good already. And that was just a few months ago, you know? Yeah, yeah I, th I think critter-wise, sheet mulching, I don't know. I mean, I, it feels like it brings them up to me. Yeah. It amplifies it. Uh, someone mentioned that uh, sheet mulching uh, did great on everything but Bermuda grass. And I just want to be clear when it comes to St. Augustine or Bermuda grass and even nut sedge, uh, we go layers thick. And um, if you ever get a chance to attend one of our Hugel culture or, or lasagna mulching workshops with Pollyanna and Studio Petrichor, we show you how to do it and do it well. And there's living proof of a, a project on Orange Grove Boulevard in Pasadena that is just exploding. There was a recent TikTok video that we added of it. Our last, our most recent one. Um, yeah. Uh, Lori, you <clears throat> raised your hand. Yeah. Hi. So I think um, David and others have mentioned Hugel culture. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm familiar with the concept. But somebody told me that, so I live in San Diego that it doesn't do well here in Southern California. Um, so I wanted your take on that. Well, we have, I don't know, how many hundreds of feet of hoogles throughout yes. Southern California that we learn from every day. So um, a lot of people have issues um, with certain things, but uh, I don't know. My, uh, my muse here has taught me everything and... Uh, well, I've done hundreds of yeah. eagles, and at this point, I can say there are very few failures. And in each of those cases, we've learned something important that improves our processes. And um, we are going to have an upcoming presentation on Hugel culture through Metropolitan Water District. And G3. And G3. Green Gardens Group. And so I just put our website address in there. If you sign up for our newsletter, it's supposed to be on our website, but it's not. Um, that event is going to be announced. G3 is putting on a whole training uh, around Hugo culture and has asked, has asked us to present on that and teach on that. So that <clears throat> training is coming very soon. And of course, join our newsletter and follow us. And there are going to be Hugo culture hands-on Hugo culture workshops. Uh, coming up very soon because we have projects that are um, underway. Yeah, I can attest to your guys' Hugel culture methods. We have copied them and with great success, zero failures. It works wonderful, wonderfully okay. in all of the applications we put it to. They just go crazy. All the plants that we <laughs> stick in them just like are supercharged. It, like they get filled out so fast. It's awesome. I love them. And it creates interest in topography. And it's just like another way of like, you know, building in structure to a garden. It's, they're, uh, they're so useful from a design point and in terms of the ecology and just the results that you get so quick. It's like, I love them. I love Hugels. Thank you, Lee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I have to give that a hear here. Also, Hugel culture, I think like when you're using it, I mean, in other words, and forgive, correct me if I'm wrong, but I mean, I've built a few now and I find if I just, if people are using hugel cultures to grow a lot of vegetables, they're using different soil, they're using different soil amendments, they're using things you probably wouldn't use if you're gonna do California native plants, but the basic principles are the same and the value that, that slow nitrogen release and yeah, also just in terms of, you know, and how it impacts the land and creates shape and gives you movement and form, all those things, like it's kind of a win-win uh, in, in my, you know, in my experience and application of it. I even, I just finished a fairly big hillside, about 1500 square feet, really steep. And what I did is I just had a bunch of the oak tree that came down on site. So I just broke, I chopped it all up let it dry out for a while. And then every plant on the slope, I built a tree a V kind of into the slope. And then I built a little uh, a little berm with the oak and planted each plant kind of into a branch going all the way up the slope. So it also functions when water comes down, it slows water down from the top. If it flows over, it flows over into the next berm and the next berm and the next berm. So kind of, I feel like um, 
the difference in terms of how fast those plants kind of like bounce back, how they start to grow, the speed is really I, like obvious to me that when you work with wood and when you're when you're working like hookah cultures and things like that, things just grow faster and they seem to grow happier and you're just holding on to water. And the most amazing part is it's all free. Yes. Yeah. That's yeah. the insanity. Mm -hmm. These answers are so simple and we overcomplicate it. Yeah. They're we, so simple. We we interrupt the waste stream. We're taking things that would be discarded, the cardboard, um, the uh, branches and, and green waste, and use those and turn them into rich, wonderful soil that is what we've depleted on the planet. And it's our way of giving back, our, our apology to the earth for mm -hmm. what we've done to it. And we've had terrific results with that. Um, Valeria, RP Valeria, just mentioned that she has an overabundance of stinging nettle that she wants to take care of, or he, I don't know, I can't tell. But uh, I just want to know where you live because I'd like to come harvest it yes. because it makes amazing pesto and is awesome to eat and delicious as long as you know how to prepare it. And a very, very healthful, healthy tea. Yeah. It's really good tea. I would, I would be eating it if I were you. That's, yeah. that's your weed control. <laughs> Or you can borrow my tortoise and just oh, bring it over. Oh, yeah. I did want to mention in March, uh, we're going to have an event with Doug, Doug Kent. Uh, and he's going to, uh, we're going to do a, a foraging event in the Upper Arroyo in March. So stay tuned for that too. Oh, Don Powell. Don. Hi, kids. <laughs> uh, I'm in Minneapolis. Where it is, uh, I've got we got three feet of snow, and it's about seven below at the moment. I used to live up there, not far from Yuzhong. And uh, uh, is this? I just my question basically is: Is this going to be mostly about California, or do you have things that I can apply here whenever the snow goes away? Great question. <clears throat> still thinking I, I i have someone in minneapolis uh in in the area who is quite brilliant and if you if you dm me i'll send you his information he does work it's all based on these principles and uh is doing incredible work uh creating habitat i'm, I'm a giant fan well I, just, yeah I, if you just so if you send a note to Wild Yards Project at Gmail, I'll send you his information. Even if you know, even if he's not close enough to come and do it himself, he can certainly like. I think <clears throat> because you're you're obviously you're dealing with with different plant systems and things like that, and he's uh, he's pretty far down the road, and his projects are stunning. <clears throat> well, I've yeah. got a, a in the front of of the house. I've got maybe a half acre of. Well, mostly lawn now. Yeah. But I've I've made this last year, two years now, I've made a about a two hundred foot um, kind of an oval of of uh, wild plants and, and some natural things here, and I want to expand it. And uh, I mean, that's what that's. One thing I'm, you know, that's why I'm interested in this because I've yeah, yeah, you, you I've followed John along for a long time, yeah. years as far as his his work in this thing, and uh, he's he's had uh, I, I've I've known him since he had some very scary animals in his uh, collection. <laughs> <laughs> well, <clears throat> I can't help with the scary animals, but I can introduce you to Dan. And he'll get a garden that will bring scary animals to your garden. Yeah. No, he's he's really good. Uh, you know, it's it's a different. I mean, I get jealous working with people back east because uh, you know they can do these just massive wildflower plantings, and those they, they stay like, you know, they, they stay up until you know whatever October, you know, and then they die yeah, back. Yeah. I'm like, if I if we did that here, you know, you you'd, you'd have a pretty dry, crispy site. You know, we have to work with bigger perennials and things like that. But um, you, you want to meet Dan. You want to talk to Dan. He'll inspire the hell out of you. 
Thank you very much. Yeah, Don, I mean, ultimately the principles apply, the plants are different. Okay. All the principles apply, the plants are different. That's it, okay? Okay. Uh, so you reach out to David, um, and of course, I'd always love to hear from you, dude. You do. Let's get, let, are we gonna go get some, what was that, aromatics prawns over Absolutely. at the- uh, you got it, baby. <laughs> okay. That's it. Um, we have time for two more questions, and Almond has uh, her answer, uh, her uh, hand raised. Hello. Um, you're talking about the hillside that you've been working on recently, and I saw online you mentioned it's a lot of DG, and I've got a pretty crumbly, very steep DG hillside mm -hmm. that I've got to work with. And I was wondering if you have any recommendations for plants that have root systems that like hold that particular type of soil <clears throat> together or any, any more recommendations about that? It sounds like, like the last three that I did. Mm. Um, I mean, it, you're here and you're in the region. Yeah, I'm in Montrose. <laughs> and where, where did you say you are? Montrose. Okay. Yeah. Real close. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, most of the plants of our chaparral are perfectly happy. In fact, they're thrilled to be in DG. Mm -hmm. So it just comes, it's just a matter of how, I don't know how loose or, or what your orientation of the sun is, but it, it's just about like, is it a full sun or are you down? Is it oak woodland? Is it, you know? Um, it's like, a, it was like a cut into the hill. And then there's like a, a cement wall and my house is right there. It's kind of like in a in a canyon between my house and this really steep cut. So it's, it's been fully shaded so far, but I know the sun's like creeping in more and more. Yeah. So so Sean uh, and Lee just posted. Mm. Uh, these are actually uh, many of the plants that I just planted, except for creeping snow mm. right, that I just did on this hillside. Prunus alyssifolia would be really happy and that and, and actually can take part shade. Mm. Tuyan, Ruzovada, like he has. Um, uh, if it's full sun, California buckwheat will do great. Uh, black sage uh -huh. will be black sage will do great. Okay. Uh, and they're mm. all really good at slope stabilization and things like that. And then yeah. uh, anyway. I, I I'd, I'd like to plug uh, Car Hardy Californians almonds since you're up in our area. Contact Parker, Hardy Californians, follow them on Instagram. They've got this awesome nursery. I think it's in Sierra Madre, right, Parker? That's correct. Thank you so much, Sean, for mentioning. Yeah, of course. It. Yeah, we're yeah, there. We're there Tuesday out. through Yes. <laughs> yeah. You Almond can... knows. Almond's been there. Um, oh, good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there yeah. you go. If but you for can... everybody else. <laughs> You, mm. If you want to just DM me, I'll just send you my plant list that I just put on this. Mm. It, it's basically that right there with a few more. Thank you. Um, it also depends if you want like a low, I don't, I, I have to see, you know, if you want a low foreground. Uh -huh. you know, so there's, a, there's plenty of little, there's wildflowers and some, some, some mounding uh, perennials that'll go down there too. But mm. Park, Parker has them all. They're all there. Mm. Yeah. Wonderful. And for that, Parker, I get five hummingbird sage. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. After you've held my 25, please. <laughs> I got you guys both. No worries. Okay. Um, we're going to take one more question. And before uh, mm -hmm. we take that question, what I'd like everybody to do, because there's so much juicy information in the chat, copy and paste all of it right now before we say goodbye, because I don't think it's going to be in the show notes when we have this recorded. Do we have any more questions? I just need to tell Parker that I posted a thing the other day about, because there was such a perfect example of cheat grass on a slope and then this uh, stabilization that we did. And I was wearing his hat and uh, I got a million comments and every single comment was like, where'd you get the hat? Dude, I saw that. That was insane. That whole chat thread was blown up. Like all the all the messages were blown up. That I was stoked, man. If I had had them available online, I'm pretty sure we'd have sold a bunch that day. Yeah, but they're only yeah, available they're... in the nursery until we close. <clears throat> yeah. Um, they're, they're, we're there until the end of May. So if you want a hat, you got to come to the nursery and get it there. Uh, uh, Parker, is it at Hardy Californians on Instagram? That's correct. H-A-R-D-Y. 
uh, party Californians or Californian? Californians, plural. Okay, great. There you go. All Just right, like everybody. the book. Just like the book. Copy and there you go. The address is in there too. Copy and paste this, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, David. You guys are the best. I love you, man. You're awesome. We don't get to see David, each other rock. enough. I mean that. Let's all get together. Let's yes. all get. Let's, let's all get I, together. I, I, I want to. I want to get together and talk about ayahuasca, but we're done. All right, everybody, <laughs> have a good night. Good night, guys. Thank good you. Night. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Good night. Thank you. Thank you for coming.